Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Sam Whitefield. I'm a member of the 2014 Epic Colloquium and moderator of today's panel on political Islam in the Middle East and North Africa. I'm a sophomore here at Tufts University majoring in international relations. It's been many years since Western Europe was referred to as Christendom. This is perhaps an indication that the church in Western Europe has lost the political power it enjoyed during its medieval heyday. However, this is not the case in the region that we still today refer to as the Islamic world. There, Islam and political power are closely intertwined. During the Arab Spring, Islamist groups like Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood and Tunisia's Anahna Group were the most powerful and organized political groups, and so won the first democratic elections in their respective nations' histories. However, the struggle for the political future of these nations is ongoing, and since those elections, Mohamed Morsi, the Brotherhood's candidate for president, has been removed from that office, and the Brotherhood itself banned. In Tunisia as well, Anahda was forced out of the government in preparation for a new constitution and new elections. And this has even touched our own symposium. We had hoped that Egyptian activist Amr al Hamzawi would be here today, but he has unfortunately been detained by the Egyptian government for the crime ostensibly for the crime of tweeting uh, inappropriate remarks about the judiciary, but it's commonly believed that he's actually being detained because he was one of the few liberal activists to speak out against the crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, high profile though they are, Egypt and Tunisia are not the only examples of political Islam in action. Iran is the world's only theocracy and is increasingly playing a larger role in this region of the world. Groups like Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb and the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria want to bring to power their own radical version of political Islam. And in Turkey, the Islamist AKP has taken steps to limit the secular power of the army and craft a more religiously inspired government. We cannot understand the Mena region without understanding this important force within it. So, what exactly is political Islam? How did it develop? What do Islamists want? Can NGOs and other governments work together with Islamists? And if so, how? To answer this question, we've convened this panel of experts, and I'd like to thank them for being here today. Can you join me? Now, as you heard from Sherman, all of these panelists have valuable insights for us, and we want to get to as many audience questions as possible. So, we've asked them to give short remarks of no more than 12 minutes following this time. Green means go, yellow means you have two minutes remaining, and red means please bring your remarks to a close. After each panelist has spoken, we will move directly on to audience questions. So without further ado, let's get started. Our first panelist is Dr. Robert Parks. Dr. Parks earned his doctorate in political science at the University of Texas, and is the founding director of the Center for Maghrebi Studies in Algeria. Currently, he's writing a book on state building in Tunisia and Algeria. Dr. Parks, we're very grateful to have you here. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk about uh, political Islam in Algeria in the context of the May 2012 elections and what that means about the past of Algeria, Algeria in the Arab Spring, and uh, the future in Algeria, specifically political Islam in this context. So without <clears throat> uh, further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and read this. So on the eve of uh, the 2012 Algerian legislative elections, the Reuters office in Algiers published an article titled Islamists Post for Strong Showing in Algeria Vote, predicting an Islamist victory and going so far as to predict an Islamist head of government. Following the region-wide trend of Islamist victory, the ballot box may predicted a green tsunami in Algeria's 2012 election. Indeed, Algeria's last 20 years have been star uh, starkly marked by political Islam, whereas the 1990s witnessed the legislative victory of the Islamic Salvation Front, or FIS, in 1991, the cancellation of these elections and a decade-long civil war pitting Islamist groups against the state. The 2000s were marked by Islamist inclusion in, a parliament, in parliament and government. Given the seemingly overpowering salience of political Islam in Algerian politics, in Islamist victory, the polls seemed a sure bet. Uh, surely, Islamist victories in Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia in late 2011 had emboldened Algerian uh, Islamist parties, just as it was taken uh, that the Arab Spring had expanded the size of the Islamist electorate across the world. The proliferation of the Islamist party seemed to show new interest in political Islam. Uh, in addition to the Green Alliance, formed by Bouguera Sultani's Movement for Society and Peace, and micro-Islamist parties Isla and Nahda, which collectively held 60 seats in the outgoing parliament. Uh, slide two. 
the 2012 campaign was marked by the entry of Abdullah Jabala's Front for uh, Justice and Development and Abdul Najib Manasra's Front for Change. Shortly after the polls closed, uh, MSP leader uh, Mugera Sultani boisterously announced, we emerge victorious. Despite certain irregularities, the Green Alliance has created a political force. The same evening, Green Alliance campaign managers announced the coalition won close to 100 seats, just short of rivaling incumbent National Liberation Fronts, uh, uh, which is the Algeria's former single party. The Islamists, it seemed, had won their bet. Uh, so one can only imagine the shock uh, to party cadres gathered at Green Alliance headquarters when the Minister, uh, when the minister of the Interior announced the following day the results of the election. The Green Alliance had won only 48 seats, 12 fewer than the three parties collectively back on the 12 fewer than the three parties collectively held in the 2007 legislature, and half a million seats fewer. Indeed, the much tilted uh, Green Alliance captured a few fewer seats than the MSP had going into the election. While the combined Islamist blo uh, bloc won 50,000 more votes uh, than in 2007, greater overall participation in the 2012 elections re uh, resulted in an aggregate loss of close to 3% of the total proportion of the votes. Uh, the Green Alliance immediately cried foul. MSP campaign director and current Secretary General of the Razak Mokri uh, denounced an enormous fraudulent manipulation. Uh, Bulgaria Sultani declared a democratic re uh, regression stating the May 10th rendezvous was a failed occasion to realize an Arab Spring by the urns. Commenting, uh, uh, competing Islamist parties joined the fray. Abdullah Jabala ironically noting, these weren't elections, rather they were a theatrical performance. Clearly, Algeria's Islamists felt entitled to their share of the Arab Spring. I suggest that if anyone was acting, it was the Algerian Islamists, and Western observers, uh, mainly journalists and pundits, uh, were a very willing, uncritical audience. After two decades of Islamist insurgency, opposition, co-optation, and cooperation, few close observers of Algeria would feel comfortable claiming that most Algerians today believe that Islam is still the solution. Rather, another factor is impinged on the Islamic, on an Islamic tsunami in the elections. Unlike Egypt and uh, Tunisia, Algeria's political Islamist movement has been legal since the 1989 uh, political opening, and the regime used both carrot and stick since it canceled the results of the 1991 elections and banned the Islamic salvation front. Uh, we know the results of the stick. The cancellation of the 1991 elections led to civil war, so let's hold the discussion of the stick and the banned Islamic salvation front for a moment and look at the effects the carrot ha has had on Algeria's legal uh, Islamist parties. As part of this reconciliation process, uh, and in an effort to sideline the feast politically since 1995, the regime has adopted a policy of measured political Islamist inclusion and limited but symbolic and very lucrative power sharing. Two figures have dominated Algeria's legal Islamist movement, Abdullah Jabala and Mahfouz Nahda. Hardly strong men, uh, strong men, the leaders of both parties have a long history of Islamic activism that predated the foundation of the feast in 1989. Uh, and their historical legitimacy translated in the 1991 polls MSP and Anahda, the two parties they run, aside from the combined five, uh, 500,000 votes from the Islamist bloc that the peace claim to represent from the, 1991, from the 1990 to the 1991 elections. Uh, the two men and the parties they built have taken divergent, subsequently taken divergent positions on the question of whether to participate in government, positions which have subsequently affected both men and both parties. Abdullah Jabal's steadfast position to keep his political parties in the opposition have generated much respect of grassroot, uh, grassroots uh, Islamic militants. But the refusal to participate in government has cost him the leadership of two parties, first in Nahda in 1998, and Isla in 2007. Then, high ranking cadres of both parties evicted Jabala in the hopes of joining government and gaining access to greater financial resources. Many hopes were placed on Jabala in the new party, the Front for Justice and Development, in 2012. However, his past experience with internal party coups appears to have greatly affected him. Jabala placed both Kith and Ken in key leadership positions in the new party. His wife was the number one in the Al Algiers list. Um, uh, and, and he explained this move <clears throat> as a barrier against future internal party coups. However, contraceptive against nascent party coups, military rank and file, as well as Algerian uh, society at large, viewed the news ne nepotistic and cynically laughed it off. Jabala's party won a little more than 200,000 votes in the 2012 elections. Algeria's second uh, legal Islamist party, but not less important, <clears throat> the Mughal Society of Peace has had its own problems due to the party's links to the regime. Algeria's official representative of the Muslim Brotherhood's international organization, the MSP, long uh, participated in coalition government, first under the stewardship of Nahda and later Sultani, holding ministerial seats from 1997 to 2012. Though the largest Islamist party, the MSP's candidate for the 2004-2009 presidential elections, was none other than Algeria's sitting president, no pun intended, Abdelaziz Bouteflika. 
While this proximity to power has brought the advantages of access to resources, it too has been a source of anxiety and tension within the party. In October 2009, a Swiss court indicted Sultani in charges of having tortured a citizen within the Algerian Ministry of Defense. While the plaintiffs later dropped the charges, the case generated much discussion in Algeria and was a significant embarrassment to the party. Less than a month later, a month later, a major scandal broke within the USP-controlled Ministry of Public Works, allegedly linking ministry cadres and party businessmen to a nebulous web of Chinese entrepreneurs and international arms dealer Pierre Falcone. Proximity to government, cumulative scandals, and probably a bit of pushed MSP Vice President and former Minister, uh, Minister of Industry, Abdul Majid Min, uh, Minasra, to challenge Sultani for party leadership in 2008, and he eventually quit the party, founding in 2012 the Front for Change. Uh, to ride the green tsunami so anticipated in the May, 19, uh, the May 2012 uh, legislative elections, and to parry criticisms both within and outside the party, in January 2012, Sultani of the MSP announced his departure from the presidential alliance with much fanfare though it kept its ministerial portfolios. And in March 2012, Sultani and the MSP announced a green alliance with Islamist parties al and al-Isla, formerly led by Jabala, whose electoral strength themselves evaporated with the departure of the former leader. As I discussed briefly in my introduction, Islamist efforts to surf the green tsunami came to naught. Since Sultani has quit the leadership of the MSP, while MSP Minister of Public Works quit the party, declaring at the inaugural meeting of his new party, the Rally for Algeria and Hope, we are not in the Islamist party, the time of ideology is over. Our only religion is work. Algeria's legal Islamists are known entities. Jabala and Asra Sultani who have participated in Algerian politics since the 1991 elections. In 20 years, Jabala has founded three different Islamist parties and been ejected from two. The MSP has held ministerial portfolio since 1997. It created the presidential coalition with the FLN and RD in 2004, putting only five months ahead of elections while cynically holding on to its ministries. And it's been recently involved in several high profile corruption scandals. Manasseh's attempt at recreating political virginity had come to naught. Algerians remember him as a corrupt minister of, uh, of industry from 1997 to, uh, to 2002. In short, far from sharing the popular mystique the Muslim Brothers or Nahda had over the electorate in Egypt and Tunisia, Algeria's Islamists uh, are widely viewed as stakeholders in the system. Anecdotally, in Iran, Algeria's second largest city, uh, political Islamists are widely referred to, uh, as, uh, sort of being a member of a, 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 an Islamist party is, is widely referred to having one's commercial register, underscoring the population's views linking political Islam to corruption and parasitic business practices. The sine qua no condition for Algerian political Islamists to gain significant gains in the 2012 parliament was an expanded post Arab uprising Green electorate. And yet, before the 2012 election, the growing disaffection with political Islam seemed evident in the steady decline of shared votes for the Islamist bloc in Algerian legislative elections over the past decade and a half. Next slide. Collectively, the Islamist bloc captured 22% 20 of the vote in 1997, dropping to 15% in 2002 and to 13% uh, in 2007. With a stagnant, if not declining, of Islamist electorate, the Green Alliance, FDJ, and FC, and recently accredited micro parties running new Islamist platforms cannibalize each other, effectively canceling out gains as individual parties or as a block at the expense of larger uh, FLN or RD parties. Next slide. The Islamist electorate's not grown, rather it appears to have shrunk over the last decade. According to the results of the 2004-2011 Arab Barometer Service for Algeria, the number of Algerians in favor of democracy over non-democratic over non regime uh, has remained around 20 percent. Within that, or, I'm sorry, 80 percent. Within that 80 percent, however, the number of Algerians that indicate a preference for an Islamic democracy over a secular democracy has dropped from 39 percent in 2004 to a little more than 23.4 percent in April, May 2011, when the survey was last done. Uh, uh, and this, of course, when the survey was done, was nearly half a year before Islamist victories in Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia. Next slide. Inclusion in the Algerian political system is a result of the pro proliferation of Islamist parties, each seeking to capture the existing Islamist electorate while pushing the boundaries of that electorate outward. Divergent political strategies and strong personalities among the parties that divided the movement, hindering the capacity of working in a meaningful way as a united bloc. Inclusion, uh, too, seems to have moderated Algerian political Islam. Working in the government coalition has its advantages and disadvantages, attested by the continued leadership struggles Sultani once had and Jabala also uh, faced. While refusing to, to accept the system uh, came, uh, comes or came at great cost. So what does all this mean for the banned Islamic Salvation Front? Lacking survey data, we really don't know. However, we do know that unlike Nahda in Tunisia or the Muslim Brother in Egypt, the feast was a populist movement and very much the creation of its time, marked by significant economic decline in which Algerians sought a whatever price to cast away the single party National Liberation Front. The majoritarian electoral system put in place in 1991 ensured 
an electoral majority with less than a quarter of registered voters. So the feast won with all registered voters about 25% of the vote. The Algerian regime has since adopted the PR system, which would have tempered the number of seats won in 1991 and perhaps tempered the imagined, if not reified, impact the feast has had on the Algerian electorate. Uh, moreover, in the minds of many Algerians, the feast, or more broadly Salafism, is linked with the fit of the 1990s and close to 100,000 deaths. The imagined spoils of a national reconciliation process, which offered material gains to jihadists who came down from the mountains for the last few years, moreover, has angered many former rank and file members of the feast who described their participation in the movement to mean in terms similar to brown shirt recruitment of youth and fascist ranks uh, in the 1930s. Uh, the feast moment offered opportunities for imagined social promotion to those who had been hitherto left out of the system, and which is significantly open. When former feast number two Ali Bahaj arrived in Bebel Wed during the January 2011 riots, riots that occurred simultaneously, some riots, anti uh, Ben Ali riots in Tunisia, uh, uh, he was uh, chased by a new generation of youth who shot and were not the sheep of our parents' herd. Banned for 20 years now, it's likely that the figures uh, I've presented may well confirm that fee support in the electorate has slowly eroded. Former activists and sympathizers alike have either demobilized or migrated to alternative Islamist parties that offer uh, slight advantages. In 2014, it's hard to imagine Algerian Islamists actively uh, promoting uh, Algerian Islamists actively promoting the return of the peace of politics. The leadership of none of Algeria's legal parties. Uh, supports a lift of the ban on the feast. So finally, the Arab Spring, plural Islam in Algeria. Uh, many international observers and pundits alike expected Algeria to collapse in the face of region-wide anti-regime protests and revolution. When it did not, the same pundits predicted Islamist victory in the polls. Neither occurred, and for a simple uh, but often discounted reason, the majority of Algerians remained wary of the Arab Spring. While most would really <coughs> encourage reform, few support revolution as seen in Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, or Syria, or Yemen. Uh, to many Algerians, the Arab Spring is associated with foreign intervention, radicalism, and fitna. In short, it's associated with the Algerian Civil War in the 1990s. However, the anecdote of Ali Belhaj and Bebel in January 2012, as well as the experience of Algeria's legal Islamist parties in the last two decades, may well prove that Algeria is neither an exception nor a case we should dismiss on account of the canceled 1991 elections. Algeria has already gone through the experiment or dual process of exclusion, which resulted in civil war and inclusion, which is a result of moderate, moderation and dis, uh, disengagement from the status quo. Algeria's long and tumultuous experience with political Islam may well explain why, in 2011, of the country surveyed in the Arab Barometer Report, the political Islam appears to resonate less in Algeria than elsewhere in the Arab world. Final slide. With the exception of Lebanon, in 2014, it seems clear that most Algerians' Islam is not the solution. Whether and how this moment of political behavior evolves is dependent on how Algeria's legal Islamists negotiate their place and role in Algerian society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Parks. Our next speaker is Isanda Ramrani. Isanda Ramrani is a Moroccan American journalist currently living in Cairo. He writes for a variety of publications, including The Economist, The Financial Times, The Lemon Review of Books, Foreign Policy, The National, and Egypt. He also has a column in Al Basri Al Yom, Egypt Today. He commonly appears on Al Jazeera English as a commentator on Middle Eastern affairs and was formerly the International Crisis Group's analyst on Egypt and North Africa with a focus related to issues on political Islam. Thank you very much for being here, Mr. Ahmad. Thank you. Uh, I have to begin by, by correcting that introduction. I think you have my old bio. Uh, I, I am currently, all of this is true what you said, but I am currently no longer a journalist. I am the North African Director for the International Crisis Group. So, so I've been called back, we drafted back into uh, ICG. Uh, um, I have to say that because uh, my, my employers would not be happy that I would be appearing in public in another capacity. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, as I said, my, the, the work that, we, uh, that I do at uh, International Crisis Group uh, uh, focuses on North Africa, where we have a presence in three uh, countries uh, uh, on the ground, in Egypt, uh, where I'm based, and our Egypt analyst is based. We also have analysts in Tripoli, Libya, and in Tunis. Uh, and my, what, what I'm going to say, the points I'm going to make today would draw on the insights of my colleagues, as well as my own, uh, about these three countries and the experience of the last three years uh, uh, with regards to Islamists' uh, political performance there when they were in power, there, uh, uh, how well they governed, and of course, uh, uh, a 
especially after what happened in Egypt uh, last summer, the overthrow of uh, President Mohamed Morsi, the reasons for for uh, uh, for those developments and the recalibration uh, of the region after a moment where it seemed that Islamists were on the ascendant to a moment uh, where they are on the defensive. Right. There's three main points that I want to discuss. The first is why did Islamists win? Why were they successful in, uh, uh, at least in Tunisia and Libya, in winning the plurality of the vote, or majority if you include in, uh, 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 in Egypt uh, not only the Muslim Brotherhood but also the Salafi parties? Uh, they won about together about 75% of uh, the parliamentary vote. Um, in Libya, they didn't win a majority, but they were able to maneuver into a position where they are perceived today as the controlling <coughs> faction between the Muslim Brotherhood, Salafis, and others, the controlling faction in the GNC, where, where, where at least they have, a, they have a large enough minority to be able to block uh, uh, things, the GNC being the General National Congress uh, of the Eastern Parliament. Of Libya. So, the reason I think for their success is, is multiple. First of all, it's true that in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood had a long-established grassroots movement that was delivering services, medical services, uh, 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 free education, uh, help to the poor, that they were able to build on. But that's not necessarily the case for Tunisia, where in Nafta there was a lot less space for Nafta to operate. It was certainly not the case in Libya, where there was a zero-tolerance approach to the Muslim Brotherhood by the Gaddafi regime. I think that more than grassroots, probably they benefited from the psychological effect, that it's, it was their turn that they represented for a long time, and they represented also by the former regime of the opposition. So therefore, once the former regimes fell, it made sense that, uh, 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 why not try them out? Uh, another thing is that they have discipline, in that, unlike the liberal camp, they didn't fragment into multiple par parties centered around multiple personalities, but were, were able to maintain a certain degree of cohesion, and they have money which is essential, as in anywhere else in the world, for a successful campaign. They have access to resources that many other parties do not have access to. Um, I think if you take all these factors together, it gives us a, a good idea of why they won. Yes, there is support in these societies for these movements and for political Islam in general. But to say, as many were saying in 2012, after the first round of election had taken place, that this was the natural order of things, that in a democratic system in these countries, the Islamists would automatically win, I think hides the real diversity of views uh, 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 in these societies. Uh, because elect to win elections, elections are not, are more complicated than a, than a popularity contest, and they're not a national poll. There are, especially parliamentary elections, have very specific conditions uh, depending on the electoral system being used, depending on the local politics of the constituency in which uh, 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 candidates are running. That does afford uh, for a wide range of results. I mean, my, in each of the country I know best, I do know that, that, that my own impression, and I think, is, is borne out by polls, and it's even borne out by the extrapolation of. Uh, of um, election results, the core committed uh, uh, following of an organization like the Muslim Brotherhood or the, the North Party, Southeast Party, does not represent probably more than 20-25% of the population. But the Islamists are able to bank on that core following and then benefit from the Nor effect and prior to 2000, prior to their experience in government, uh, uh, the benefit of the doubt that allowed them to uh, increase their electoral power uh, significantly. Um, and, and I think that's important to remember. Islamists are not the necessary the, the options are not as straightforward as democracy but then the Islamists win, or autocracy and then keep the Islamists out and the liberal tendencies out. Uh, and the scene is much more complicated, I think, in our, uh, in our three countries. Uh, and indeed, you could argue that in both Tunisia and in Egypt, the Islamists were worried about the Muslim Brotherhood and in, in particular were worried about doing too well. They actually tried not to, to limit 
the degree to which they would uh, overwhelm the, 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 the political scene. And I think this was quite important in Anahda's approach in Tunisia, in that it was very conscious that they, a hostile establishment, uh, doubts among uh, uh, the Tunisia's traditional allies of, uh, and, and, of course, its neighbors, uh, its neighbor to the west, in Bichur, where there was a lot of, uh, in Algeria, a lot of worry about what an Islamist-led Tunisia meant. And they tried to manage this, and it's in, it's in, in its management of these tensions that al Nahda actually turned out, I think, to be uh, much more successful than the Muslim Brotherhood, which after initially showing some caution, eventually decided that it would go the whole way and try to win the whole pot, and, and, and I think that played the role in general tensions against it. The second point I'd like to make is about this issue of Islamism versus secularism. That this, especially after the coup in Egypt, uh, appears to be the main division in, at least if we look at these three countries. And certainly, uh, I think, the, the, what happened in Egypt has ex exacerbated tensions in the neighboring countries. And we frame, sometimes, the political debate along this Islamist versus secularist line. The reality, though, is much more complicated. It's not necessarily ideological position to political Islam and to the, ideo the, 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 the policies of uh, these parties that was the source Attention. There's other, uh, it was part of it, obviously, but, but there, there are other things involved. I think competition over resources is a major uh, uh, source of these tensions. In a country like Libya, where the prize is control of the oil resources, this is very clear. And if you look at what is probably described as the Islamist camp versus the secularist camp, well, you can say that the, Islamists, that the secularists are any less conservatives than most of the Islamists. Libya as a whole is a conservative society. The uh, National Forces Alliance uh, clearly stated during the elections that it believes in the implementation of Sharia law, and it's supposed to be the secular bloc. Uh, the, um, and and, and the, the, there's an overlay, I think, of a whole bunch of other divisions in this Islamist versus secular debate. Divisions of class, tribal divisions in a country like Libya where tribalism plays an important role, uh, provincialism, certain regions feel underrepresented, I think this is quite an important part of the picture in Tunisia, where, as you know, the, uh, the uprising of, of late 2010 began in the interior regions, and one of the major fault lines in Tunisian politics is the fault line between the coastal elites and the much more interior provinces. We see that actually translated in the wider uh, political division and some hostility now, including inside NACA, to the emergence of the same co coastal elites inside the NACA party. And their dealings, their brokering of a deal with their counterparts in the secular parties. Um, and, and Islamist parties actually have, 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 are having a tough time, I think, in the region generally speaking, and I've had a tough time in the last few years, in managing these other tensions that uh, uh, where often leaders of these parties have difficulty selling what they want to do to their base. Um, there's other, another fundamental uh, part of the equation, <coughs> and in Algeria also, uh, where experts in Algeria will confirm this, is that the politics of these countries is about competition over resources. And these are countries where uh, a tremendous amount of state capture has taken place. So whether it's about control of oil companies, uh, control of the state and the resources of the state, these have been as much part of the supposed Islamist versus secularist fight as anything else. In my personal opinion, one of the reasons that the Muslim Brotherhood generated so much hostility in Egypt as well as the mistakes it made and perhaps its bad governments and so on, was that it was perceived as a secret society. It was perceived as a secret society in a country where personal connections are incredibly important to getting things done. And if you're a secret society and you offer no easy way to become a member, then you're very threatening in a system where Vasta, where connections, are uh, 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 
key currency. The third point that I wanted to raise is about this idea that the overthrow of Morsi, the compromises made by Nahda, the difficulties that the par uh, parties like Justice and Construction in Libya have, uh, which represents the Muslim Brotherhood, have had in, in uh, imposing themselves, represent a failure of political Islam. I think it's both a naive view and an unfair view. It's unfair because the reasons that these parties were uh, uh, did not govern as effectively as they might have, I mean, they're responsible for, for, for their mistakes, yes, but they were facing situations where any political force would have had to face tremendous challenges. So I think to say that Mohamed Morsi was overthrown because he mismanaged the country is an oversimplification that doesn't really represent the, the challenges he's faced, including, and, and, and this is something we saw in Egypt and we see, I think, to a lesser extent in Tunisia, it's a lot of corporatist resistance inside state institutions who resisted the Muslim Brotherhood not because it was Islamist, but resisted it because it wasn't, it had ambitions to replace the power elite in these institutions. Not in a particularly, again, not with a, a necessarily an ideologically driven agenda, it was a simple question of power. They wanted to neutralize potential uh, sources of uh, opposition inside the state, and this scared a lot of people. This was people's livelihood, people's uh, political influence, and networks that were threatened. Se secondly, they, they, um, I, I think it's the idea of the failure of political Islam is naive, because it's not as if political Islam has disappeared. It's not as if the idea among a minority, but a substantial minority of the populations of these countries doesn't remain committed to certain ideas, whether it's increasing, uh, implementing Sharia, whether it's imposing traditional Islamic uh, punishments, whether it's uh, 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 making society more pious, more virtuous. These ideas will continue to thrive. And the parties that, uh, when given an opportunity, I think the parties that advance these ideas will continue to have a constituency. So the idea that because the Muslim Brotherhood may have governed very badly in Egypt, that all Islamists have lost everywhere is, is, uh, is a logical uh, uh, fallacy. In fact, when we see, even in Egypt, where the space for Islamists has been dramatically reduced in the last year, but there remains some space, the Salafi party, the North party, is uh, 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 has a, continues to have a chance to participate, I think it will continue to, to fight the culture wars. Uh, they have been fighting uh, 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 in, in the past in different ways, uh, whether it's against the divorce laws to, to implement more restrictions on uh, what the Ministry of Culture can publish and so on. These fights will go on. And for that more time, so I'll end it here. Thank you very much, Mr. Ramani. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Mohamed S. Dajani Daoudi, who has been chosen to receive the Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award. And so to present this award to him, I would like to invite fellow colloquial members Becky Allen and Eloise Parnett down to present the award.
distinguished scholars and practitioners dedicated to solving the world's most pressing problems. Dr. Dajani Dowdy is a Palestinian scholar who has dedicated both his professional and personal life to promoting peace and religious tolerance in and between Israel and Palestine. Dr. Dajani Dowdy serves on the board of both the House of Water and Environment in Ramallah and the YMCA in Jerusalem. He is also the founding director of the American Studies Institute at Al Quds University, which aims to establish understanding and cooperation between Palestinians and Americans, and to provide Palestinian students the opportunity to learn about American affairs. Arguably most impressive, Dr. Dajani Dowdy is also the founder and executive director of Wasatia, an independent, nonpartisan NGO dedicated to the promotion of a moderate Islamic movement as well as moderate religious, political, and social values within the Palestinian community. Founded in 2007, Wasatia promotes pluralism, democracy, and justice, which Dr. Dajani Dowdy believes are critical values in creating peace. On behalf of the Institute for Global Leadership at Tufts, we are proud to present this award to Dr. Mohammed Dajani Dowdy. Jewish friend. 
and he opted to stay away from uh, Jews, from Israelis, from anybody who remem reminded him of his past. And uh, however, when he went back to Jerusalem, uh, at the beginning he had the difficulty of living with the other and knowing that the other is all around him. And so he stayed away until his father, who was suffering from cancer, decided, uh, asked him to join him to his chemotherapy in a Jewish hospital in Ma'in Karim in Jerusalem. And then, he, uh, being there, he saw uh, the Israeli doctors taking care of his father. And so that helped him to see the other side of the enemy. And it, uh, it left a lot of impact. His father died of cancer, yet he, the impact of being in the hospital, seeing uh, doctors taking care of his father, and then seeing that doctors are not only taking care of his father, but also of many other Palestinians, patients within the hospital, affected him to see the other as a human being. And then the more, um, more relative, uh, another story was, Another, the, the, the second, the third narrative is the, his, um, his experience with his mother when on uh, Friday afternoon he uh, took her to uh, Tel Aviv. She had asthma and then the, uh, she, uh, she had an asthma attack and then her inhalers were empty and it was a Friday afternoon so he, his brother and his niece who were with her uh, wanted uh, to drive her back to Jerusalem. She, the asthma, uh, then shifted to become a heart attack. And then uh, uh, driving along the road, they came uh, to uh, the uh, Jerusalem, uh, uh, Ben Gordon Airport exit. Uh, his brother decided to, opt to go there to seek help. He was against, totally against it, because he believed that soldiers would turn them down and it would be a waste of time. Yet, when the, uh, the brother did not take his advice and then drove up to the Israeli soldiers and telling them about the, story, about the uh, patient they had. And the soldiers immediately vacated the area and then suddenly two ambulances were there and for more than an hour, for more than one hour they were uh, uh, trying to resuscitate his mother. Uh, then they took her to a nearby uh, military hospital where they found out that she died on arrival. Uh, driving back, and they couldn't take it because it was Friday afternoon, it was Shabbat. So driving back in the car, he was looking at the uh, empty seat and thinking of, uh, of her, of his loss, at the same time of his enemy who was trying to help her. So basically, uh, the fourth narrative I would like to tell is the narrative of um, uh, standing in, uh, on the fourth floor of, a, uh, of a, an office that overlooked the road, and it was in 2006, and Hamas was elected as, uh, uh, as a Palestinian uh, governing uh, party, uh, sharing uh, Fatah, uh, with Fatah. However, people after a while were dismayed for many reasons. And then he was overlooking the checkpoint that separates between the West Bank and Jerusalem, and in the checkpoint, there were more than 500 people who were uh, trying to smash their way to the checkpoint to go to Jerusalem to pray because it was a Friday morning and it was Ramadan and they uh, wanted to go to pray. He, he, he was looking at them and thinking that there would be a clash, people there would be shooting and then uh, people uh, will, uh, will die. and. Uh, it would be a media event as expected. However, after a while, and they were, the Israelis were pushing them back from the them tear gas, and uh, for a while, uh, the, it became very tense. Uh, however, things cooled down after a while, and then he realized that there was a deal made between the soldiers and the, uh, and the citizens, the uh, Palestinian citizens. The soldiers brought buses, took their IDs, and then the buses took them, took them to the Haram, they paid, and then came back to the checkpoint, and their ideas uh, were given back to them. He looked at that experience and thought, uh, this is a win-win situation. The, these people are not radical, as uh, one would have thought. They are not Hamas, they are not Jihad Islami, they are not Hezbollah Tahrir, they are just 
uh, normal Palestinian moderate people who just wanted to go to pray. Otherwise, they would not have made the deal with the Israeli soldiers. On the other side, the Israeli soldiers used rationality in order to actually have compassion in order really to uh, let these people go through to pray in Jerusalem. Uh, so he thought uh, these are moderates, these are Muslims, and uh, the question is they are not Hamas, the question is who represents them. And this is how Wasatiya movement started. I'd like to actually take a few minutes to show you some of the work that has been done within the few minutes we have in order to uh, in order to just give you an idea about uh, the uh, work we, we do. So basically, it is, uh, it is, these were the first conferences that we had. We had an annual conference in order to promote the concept of moderation. Initially, our concept started with uh, moderation in Islam, and then it developed to be moderation in religion and then it developed to be moderation among human beings. So basically, although it started with a religious concept, however, it is now more, it is more uh, between uh, moderation Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and in this way we are trying to uh, bring uh, this culture within the Palestinian community in order that we, uh, we, uh, we try to see how uh, Islam is being actually uh, brought back to the original track because there were offered that there are serious offers to show that Islam in a way is in clash with the Christianity and Judaism and uh, so there are so many misinterpretations in Islam uh, misinterpretation of Islam regarding uh, what Islam is and for instance we are being taught in Palestine that the Fatiha, uh, instead of uh, <coughs> saying that uh, those who are, uh, the Fatiha is the seven, this is the first uh, surah in the Quran, has seven verses, and it says, uh, uh, bless, uh, uh, guide us to the right path, the path of those whom you are blessed, not the path of those who, the whom you are angry, or those who are lost. So in Palestine, uh, this verse being quoted, that those who are blessed are the Muslims, God is angry with Jews, and the uh, lost are the Christians. So it is, it is the sample hunting from uh, theory of class of civilization. Uh, all the many verses in the Quran has been transformed in order to go to teach Palestinians that Islam is a clash. For instance, when the verse says, uh, 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 and, and so we have made you a moderate nation, a centrist nation, a Mediterranean nation, uh, they interpret to mean that uh, we are, as Muslims, we are centered between Jews who have killed prophets or uh, Christians who made their prophet a god. Also, there are many verses within the Quran, there are not much time to actually go through them, but uh, it is this version, radical version of Islam, uh, uh, that has been, that are now, that's now being taught in our schools. Or and in our uh, and within the community, in order to focus on uh, that Islam is in clash with the with the other, uh, we try we are working in order to uh, uh, to actually reverse that. The lesson that one can take from these four narratives I told, I, I said that uh, basically occupation brings the worst out of us, and compassion and empathy brings the best out of us. And that's why our work within, the, uh, within Palestine to reach reconciliation is to try to bring the best out of the uh, other and to have the other bring the best out of us. And to focus on uh, the common values we have in order that one day uh, Palestine and Israel can live in peace together so that we can bring our children the peace we never had we inherited from our grandparents this conflict, and we would like our children to inherit peace, coexistence, tolerance, and acceptance of them. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, Dr. Taobi. Our next speaker is Dr. Hugh Roberts, who has been chosen to receive this year's Epic Colloquium Recognition Award. To present this award, please welcome Colloquium member Kirsten Yes, Dr. Roberts, the floor is yours. 
course, I'm now taking as you can see a lower profile. <laughs> um, and um, as someone who has worked on North Africa, I have, of course, um, because of uh, the excellent uh, choices made for this panel, been completely preempted on my Algerian flag and my Egyptian flag. Uh, and so my only option is to go vertical uh, to a different level of abstraction. I'm not going to um, uh, duplicate the excellent presentations we've heard on those countries. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, raise questions about how we understand Islamism uh, uh, in general. Um, we're in the year 2014. I think I'm right in saying that means this is the this year is the 20th anniversary of a book called, in its English version at any rate, a book written by a very remarkable French scholar, The Failure of Political Islam, announced in 1994 by Olivier Roy. Um, and why was we discussing it if he was right? Um, and uh, a question I wish to ask, a, a, a provocative question, is: Is the Western world on a learning curve or not, where this phenomenon is concerned? Where is the confrontation between the Western world and its opposed or announced values on the one hand, and Islamism on the other? A case of what Nietzsche would call eternal recurrence, in other words, going round and round in circles. Um, I think that uh, there is an element of that, and I want to, in a way, uh, target it. Um, I'm struck that in quite a lot of the public discourse on Islamism in the West, and of course there's the rather specialist and sometimes a bit arcane and sometimes a bit romantic discourse of academics, and then there's a very different discourse of the Western media and Western politicians. Uh, in some of that, the latter, more general discourse, um, I'm struck by the amount of emphasis placed on ideology as explanation, ideology as cause and factor. Um, and the tendency to define Islamism as a kind of ideological aberration. This has become particularly clear, I remember following the awful bombings in London some years ago, um, the particular version of Islamism that was held to be responsible for those bombings was defined as an evil ideology that had hijacked Islam. Um, and it seems to me that this tendency to emphasize uh, ideology as the key uh, factor or, or, or cause or variable behind the, the, the phenomenon or the cluster of phenomena we are engaged with and trying to make sense of and think our positions towards uh, is naturally linked to the activity that I call trend spotting. Um, we have a lot of material published over not just the last 20 years, but so we can go much further back. 70s at least, certainly the early 80s, that tends to be about the rise of Islamism or political Islam, whatever we want, or Islam in fundamental Islam. And then we have the failure of political Islam. And it, it, it's a sort of, it, you could sort of draw a graph um, in terms of rising and failing or passing its peak and so on. And whereas I think what we are seeing or the, what we are trying to look at, whether we're actually managing to see or not, is another question. Um, is showing a remarkable capacity to revive, to resume, to pipe down at times, and then to turn up again later. Uh, and I want to suggest some reasons for that. Um, at the risk of offending my hosts, um, may I say that I personally don't like to use the term political Islam because it seems to me that it, vehicles, uh, it presupposes the dichotomy that I believe to be inaccurate. There's Islam on one hand, and then political Islam on the other. And one of the problems with that binary view is that it uh, assumes that Islam, uh, on its own, so to speak, has no uh, built-in implications for governance, whereas I would argue that it does have built-in implications for governance because it is a religion of law, like Judaism, and unlike Islam, um, and posits the existence of a community. Uh, it is not a matter uh, of kind of belief has built-in public implications. But the other problem that I want to explore a little further is the problem with thinking about political Islam as an internally undifferentiated category. Uh, and insofar as differentiation is uh, addressed and acknowledged, it tends to be, again, by means of a simple binary or simple antithesis, radical politicalism and moderate politicalism. Now, 
it is in no way uh, to question the uh, enormous value of moderation that the last speaker has reminded us of. We need to suggest that the radical moderate uh, dichotomy is not actually a very useful analog. Uh, and um, um, nine years ago, nine years ago or something, to be precise, the International Crisis Group, to which I then belong, uh, produced a, um, a document about this that suggested that the problem with this, amongst other things, is it, is it misses the degree of internal differentiation within Islamism. Uh, and if we just stay with Sunnism, majority form, it, it overlooks the fact that it's quite possible, certainly as of 2004 to 2005, to distinguish political Islamists, missionary Islamists, and jihadi Islamists. There are three major uh, strains that are quite different from each other of Islamic activism, of, in other words, Islamists. Uh, and you can't, of course, say political, political Islamists. Uh, which is why I don't like to use the term political Islam. Uh, there is Islamism that is internally differentiated between an explicitly political kind, uh, embodied in uh, movements such as the Muslim Brothers uh, and the various parties, uh, the Nahda Party in Tunisia, the parties that uh, Bob Parks has been talking about in the Algerian case, the AKP in Turkey, the PJD in Morocco. These are all Islamists that organize as political parties that operate in the public political sphere with political agendas, political objectives, and to a greater or lesser extent, in my view, a very considerable extent, incorporating models of organization and action that have actually been borrowed from Western uh, political traditions, um, while having agendas that are, of course, rooted in Islamic values. Um, that's a quite different thing from what uh, other movements do. Uh, uh, there are missionary Islamists that do not organize as uh, political parties that, that in fact uh, have traditionally condemned the brothers and, and other political Islamists precisely for being political parties on the grounds that political parties divide the Ummah, divide the community of believers. And the vision of the Ummah is Hitna, uh, the supreme evil to be averted, to be avoided. Uh, and who, far from seeking to uh, win elections uh, or even participate in elections and win power, uh, engage in missionary activity that is focused primarily on the individual, uh, on the question of what is a good Muslim, how should Muslims behave, how should they live, on the dichotomy between what is illicit, uh, halal, and what is forbidden, haram. Uh, this is the uh, central activity of the movement known as the Salafi, or the Salafi movements in the world, in the present in uh, world of the place. Uh, and uh, traditionally, the, such movements have not posed a political threat to Muslim governments, which are generally tolerated, and even though they have uh, been inclined at times to target the issue of corruption, it's never been with a view to destabilizing uh, the, the, the regime, the, the regime as a republic or a monarchy. Now, that's a very different kind of Islamic activism from the activism of the Muslim Brothers or the PJD or um, uh, Nahda. And then we have, of course, the jihadis those who engage in uh, violent strategies, armed struggle. Now, the point I'm making is that the distinction between these uh, different kinds of Islamic activism isn't a question of whether they are, uh, they take their beliefs in earnest or are sort of uh, laid back about their beliefs. It's not really a question of uh, degree, uh, moderation or lack of moderation. They have quite different diagnoses of the predicament of, of the Muslim world. Uh, they have quite different uh, priorities as a result, different objectives and different strategies, and hence different modes of operation. Uh, and um, we argued in ICG, I say we, I'm um, being anachronistic now, but uh, uh, ICG argued nine years ago that it's necessary for uh, the Western discourse to catch up with this degree of diversity uh, and um, take it into account in framing policy. Now, the reason I go into all that, and I think I only have, I have less than three minutes, is to raise the question, does that analysis still hold good? Because the water has flowed out of the bridge over the last nine years. A lot has been going on. And I'd like to suggest that um, there have been developments uh, since that book was written that um, uh, would mandate a degree of qualification. One development uh, is within the category of jihadi activity. Uh, in, in, in the view I, uh, I framed then in the we distinguish between those jihads that were classic jihads seeking to uh, reclaim land that was considered as property part of the Muslim world, our 
of Islam from uh, infidel occupation. Uh, that's classical. It's not uh, a uh, aberration in Islam at all. Those jihads that are actually revolutionary and about and trying to destabilize regimes that call themselves Muslim, and those jihads are based on a particular doctrine <coughs> and uh, tactic, and very, very problematic. And then the global jihad, uh, uh, embodied and launched was uh, notably, of course, by bin Laden and al Qaeda. Uh, there is now, it seems to be, a fourth category that one could at least uh, put on the table, and that is those jihads that are pseudo jihads. Those jihads that are not really jihad so much as jihadism in the sense of a jihad as a way of life rather than a project. I'm very struck by the North African case, and particularly the Algerian case, the persistence of movements that began as jihadi movements with political aims and have persisted in being long after it became clear those aims are quite unrealized. Uh, and have managed to uh, persist in part because of the nexus that's established with long, with illicit economic activity, long distance smuggling in particular. Uh, and it seems to me that it's a mistake to see these as posing a, a deliberate or conscious uh, political threat to two governments. They're not really tax theory, they're not really revolutionary, but they are a way of life. Uh, and that's a kind of symptom of the degree of uh, the, if you like, the degraded condition of the state in the region. And of course, uh, that's something that could very well be grown. Um, in the... I've really got 45 seconds? My God, I'm quite So let me just uh, flag two, two points. One, uh, a key development in the Egyptian story was the emergence of Salafis, previously confined to the relatively apolitical missionary activity, constituting themselves into a political party that then won a very uh, astonishing number of votes in the electoral elections of 2011. And that is a break. That is uh, breaking down the distinction between political and missionary Islamism. The party that did this has now, uh, as I understand it, split and largely, uh, I'm not sure whether it will survive, uh, or whether a political Salafism will, will sustain itself. I think that's a very curious development and one of the most interesting features of what happened in Egypt. Um, the second point, if I may use a little more than two seconds, is simply to say, I think what should be a key issue in what we debate here in, in the West, in, in the United States, in, in Europe and Britain, is whether Western policy is actually, if the Western interest is to favor the, the differentiation of Islamism, or to favor the, uh, the, an opposite process of a congealing Islamism back into an undifferentiated thing that we may call political Islam or fundamentalism or whatever. Uh, what is the Western interest? Uh, and is there actually a possibility of there being a unified Western interest? And my perception is that, in fact, there isn't a unified Western interest. Uh, but the, the uh, distinction between the interests in play in our own countries in relation to this matter are not properly articulated. And as a result, public opinion remains completely bemused by the phenomenon of Thank you very much for your remarks, Dr. Roberts. Uh, I think we're fortunate to have a timer. I was one of these students who stayed up until one in the morning listening to Dr. Roberts talk about Salafism. Uh, if we didn't have a timer, I dare say we would have been here all day because I would just let them go on and on and on. <laughs> so thank you again. Uh, our final speaker of this panel is Dr. Malafat al Rubai. He earned his doctorate in neurology at King's College Medical School in London. And on the day after he left Iraq to finish his studies there, Saddam Hussein's regime sentenced him to death in absentia. So he spent the next many years in exile in London. Uh, he was in exile, in fact, from 1979 until the American invasion in 2003. And at that point, he returned to Iraq when he was named one of the 25 members of the Iraqi Governing Council. In 2004, he was appointed as Iraq's National Security Advisor, a post that he held until 2009. He is also a former member of the Iraqi Parliament and the inaugural Institute and Fletcher Senior Statesman in Residence. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Malafak al Rubai. Thank you very much, uh, After these uh, four distinguished panelists, there's nothing for me to say. There's one thing probably different from the, uh, the four panelists, which is I come from 30 years, I guess the 30 years of my life inside the Islamist movement. Uh, I was a 
spokesman for uh, the Dao Party, Pakistani Dao Party, for 30 years. And uh, oh, well, I resigned that job in 1996. So uh, probably there, there are some lessons I can share with you, learned from that experience. Uh, number one, I reached to a conclusion that there is, uh, the question is, is politics is part of Islam as a religion? Or is it a product, the political Islam is a product of Muslims, not of a religion? I believe the latter. I believe the political Islam is a product of the Muslims rather than Islam as a religion. So it's a political Islam, I agree with the, with the doctor, uh, that uh, political Islam is a misnomer, and I think we should we should not. It's a, it's a project of Muslims, not a religion. So we can say, well, the misnomer goes as well. The, the, the Islamic theology, Islamic art, Islamic culture, Islamic literature. I think they're all wrong. I believe that we should say these are products of Muslims, not Islam. Because Islam is what is in between the two covers, the Holy Quran. That's what Islam is. So, I think we need to, when we say Islamic things, then this is sacred, this is unfolding. We can't argue with that. But when we say this is a Muslim problem, then can be wrong, can be right. We can be it. The other lesson I want to draw from my 30 years of uh, experience in the Islamic movement is this. I, do, I, I think there is a misconception in the West that if you are not Islamist, you are a secularist. This is not right. This is what I call black and white politics. I'm not Islamist, but I'm not a secularist. See, secularism in the West is completely different from secularism in the East. And my, where I sit in Baghdad, when I hear secularism, I remember the anti-religious Ataturk movement in Turkey. That's the, that's immediately comes to any intellectual in Baghdad. Or any educated person in Baghdad, in my country. So, secularism is, it means in the West, completely different things from the East. It means, in my, in my, in, in my culture, it means anti-religious. I don't want to be anti-religious, this is my religion. But I don't want to mix Islam as well, religion with politics. There is a third way, which is what I call civil order, whereby religion and politics, they run parallel to each other, but they don't, and religion has a, a, an advisory role rather than a supervisor role on politics. So they run parallel to each other, but they have their own functions and responsibilities and authorities differently. They're well defined, and they complement each other. We need religion to to, to bring this and this. And what we need to do in politics to govern. So, I, I, I don't like uh, uh, this question of are you secularist, are you, uh, are you Islamist? And this is the, it's, it's a lot of uh, uh, Western literature talking about Islam, Islam, Islam Islamist and, and, uh, and secularist. I want also to draw some, a very quick lesson. I know probably I'm oversimplifying this from Egypt and Tunisia uh, experience. Although the authorities are here, but I want to step over their uh, toes. And I believe one of the major reasons why the Islamist experience in Egypt failed miserably 
and now in Tunisia is succeeding gradually is the the one the Islamist movement in Egypt was exclusive, rigid, while the Tunisian experience is more flexible, is more inclusive. Has the experience in my country? But look at. Um, let me give you a, a narrative of from Iraq. In 2003, we found ourselves in a, with a very strange bedfellow called neocons. We, the Islamist, the Islamic movement, the Iraq. Uh, Islamic uh, Dawa Party, uh, the Supreme Council of Islamic Revolution in Iraq, the Sadrist, all, and all this, I mean all the trends, uh, you, you know, in, in, in the Islamic movement in Iraq. And we found ourselves as well, after 9th of April 2003, and with the foreign troops on our Iraqi soil. Now, by the literal meaning of Islam, we have to fight these foreign forces. But they have liberated us. There is a, contra there is a contradiction here. We sorted out that one. We said, okay, we resist political, political resistance, peaceful resistance, to get the occupying power out of the country. And we managed to do it in nine years, or in eight, 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 and in some nine years. So that is it. And another lesson from that, followed by these three Islamic trends in Iraq, in theory, in their constitution, in their political program, they all call for an Islamic state. But none of them now try to implement an Islamic code of practice and politics. All of them have called for a civil constitution. And that's what we have in Iraq. And that's what we are building in the country. A civil order, a civil uh, system. Not a secularist, not a religious. Despite the fact the three trends, Islamic trends, in the country, in, the, in, the, in the, the ruling elite, in theory, theoretically, they call for an Islamic state. But they are ruling with a civil order. So, the Islamic movement can transform radically from calling for an Islamic state to a, a civil order. My, my last point is this. It's an advice to the Western analyst, to the Western thinker, to the Western policy makers, uh, to the Western officials. Do engage with the Islamic movement in the East, in, in the Muslim world. Do engage with them because your engagement, you will understand them better and you will remove a lot of fears and uh, this paranoia and, and the conspiracy, conspiratorial theory which is prevailing in the Middle East. Thank you very much. I'd like to again extend my thanks to all of our panelists for being here today. So as I previously announced, we're now going to move on to the audience question portion of this panel. So if you do have questions for any of our panelists, please line up behind either uh, that microphone or that microphone. Oh, excuse me. I'm being very unfair to two of the esteemed uh, colloquial members. We have actually a research presentation. Uh, so yes, if you'd like to come up and present your research, I, you know, I thought we were doing really well on time. <laughs> Thank 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Max, and this past winter break, my epic classmate Rebecca Barley and I traveled to Istanbul and Ankara in Turkey, where we conducted 18 interviews uh, with Turkish academics, journalists, policy ma makers, uh, protesters, and businessmen from organizations like Zaman and Cumhuriyet newspapers, Tuscan Journals and Writers Foundation, and the International Crisis Group. Um, so we came to Turkey with an interest in Turkish politics, and specifically the idea of the Turkish model, which suggests that Turkey is a model government for the MENA region to be a successful combination of working democracy and robust capitalism in an Islamic context and Islamic state. Um, we hope the model questions are particularly relevant in light of recent political events going on in Turkey, specifically the Gay Pride protests of summer 2013. Um, and we wondered if these political appeals indicate something about the inherent compatibility or incompatibility of the three colors with themselves. Therefore, our initial research question going in was to what extent is the Turkish model relevant in the aftermath of the Gaza Pride protests? However, during the course of our interviews, um, what people taught us kind of steered our thinking in different directions. We realized that perhaps the idea of the model is not necessarily one born out of the thoughts and minds of Turks themselves, but is more of an academic theory or even a Western imposed idea. Um, that would love to see a moderate Islamic working democracy in the Turkish region. Um, what we learned is that the Turkish case is highly unique and is rooted in um, a very unique history, including the secularizing reforms of the Republic's founder. Mustafa Ataturk, in addition to reforms on the date of the Ottoman Empire. These historical roots mean that Turkey's case that we see today is not necessarily a model that you can copy and paste and export to Turkey's original partners to operate under completely different political, economic, and geographic contexts. If there's anything we learned while in Turkey, it's that the nation is still evolving. And to call it a model implies some sort of finality or culmination in development, which Many of the Turks we spoke to um, hinted that maybe Turkey has been reached yet. Um, they suggest that perhaps Turkey is still negotiating a relationship it wants between the three pillars of the model. So from the outside looking in, the question of the model seems highly relevant, but what we realize is perhaps viewing the situations in Turkey through the lens of the model kind of bottlenecks our thinking and can't best explain the situation there, nor does it raise the questions that Turks themselves are actually concerned with. Um, as one think tank analyst uh, who was told us, why are you asking me if Turkey's a model, you should ask an Egyptian. So therefore, after um, this realization, the angle of our research changed, and our question became, do the Gezi Park protests and the corruption scandal implicating the Prime Minister Erdogan and those close to him reflect the strengths or weaknesses of Turkish democracy? And from our findings, we realized that these events reflected many strengths, but also many weaknesses of Turkish democracy. First, the interviews we had with protesters in the Gezi protests really showed to us how strong of a support there is for democratic rights and individual liberties, such as freedom of speech and freedom of expression in a democratic context. But also, the corruption scandal has shown the popular willingness to investigate corruption, enforce the rule of law, and hold public officials accountable. Also, the large involvement of Turkey's youth, and Turkey has a very large uh, youth population, uh, showed a, has been seen as a real positive for Turkish democracy um, moving forward in the future. And also, the non-interference of the military in these events has been seen as a positive for Turkish democracy, as Turkey has a long history with military coups, and in times of political turmoil, the military frequently stepped into the scene in many interviews that we had people express that the fact that the military has been willing to let uh, civilian politicians and officials um, handle these events is, is a good thing. But at the same time, the violent crackdown that took place at Gezi um, has shown the real limits to freedom of expression in Turkey, such, especially freedom of speech and the right to protest. And this in turn reflects a weakness in the, Demo in the Constitution's democratic nature, as it is struggled to uphold um, these individual freedoms. And especially pertaining to the corruption scandal currently taking place, many people express concern over the weaknesses of checks and balances in Turkey. 
with the judiciary being under attack, the media under pressure not to report on these events, uh, the, the parliament being seen as a rubber stamp for the Ag Party, and the police um, really being controlled um, by Prime Minister Erdogan and his allies. And also, many professors expressed to us how these events have it showed the elite's majoritarian understanding of democracy in Turkey, where just because the Prime Minister and the Ak Party won more than 50% of votes in the past election, they seem to believe that they can do whatever they want, and if people don't like it, they can vote them out in the next election. And while the Gezi and the corruption and scandal were similar in a couple of key ways, they're also uh, different in one very important one. They're similar in that they both ex uh, have exposed an authoritarian streak within Prime Minister Erdogan and a willingness to throw his weight around in Turkish politics. In almost every interview we had, um, people mentioned this. And at the same time, these events have shown a real resistance within Turkish society and among many different groups to Prime Minister Erdogan's long rule, which has gone on since about 2002 now. But they're different in an important aspect that they reflect different divisions in Turkish society. With the corruption scandal opening up a break between the Ak Party and the Gulen movement, a civic Islamic movement, and then the Gezi Park protests showing a split between the Prime Minister and many different groups, environmentalists, liberals, secularists, communists and anarchists, and more. And while the, the ultimate effect of these events are unclear, they continue to unfold day by day, many people are looking towards the March municipal elections as pr to provide a good indication of how these, effect how these events have um, changed public opinion towards the ACT Party and whether or not they're still um, as politically strong as they were in the past. Um, so in terms of the value we felt of being in country while doing our research, we felt it extremely valuable to be in Turkey um, due to the fact that these events were actually unfolding while we were there, particularly the corruption scandal. Um, so it made people a lot more open to talking to us um, and inform our decision to make our questions more relevant. And in the end, we changed our entire perspective and research questions. For that reason, we'd like to thank the IGL, especially Heather, Sherman, um, the IGL staff, Alex and Olivia for helping us with our presentations, the Institutional Review Board for approving our research, and Tufts University. So, thank you. Thank you very much. So, I don't believe I'm running roughshod over any of my other Epic colleagues in saying that now is the time for questions to the panel. Uh, and since we've given you another about 10 minutes, I expect them to be extra good questions. Um, please ask only one question in the form of a question uh, and direct it at one panelist or to our student presenters. So, with that. Um, Sam, let me just announce to the audience and yourself that we are having a strict deadline for quarter of, or give us essentially, what, 20, 25 minutes. All right. All right. Okay. First question. Lieutenant Colonel Ali Kerjan, I'm from Hanuvar uh, College, uh, from Turkey. Uh, first of all, uh, for the presentation, uh, it's a good presentation, but it represents on one side, uh, yeah. in my opinion, because uh, the okay. people you make interview, the Zaman, the Muri, and the Tuskon, are uh, represent on one side. And uh, my question for the uh, last presentation, uh, you mentioned that our uh, Turkish constitution is weak, is a weakness. But uh, we have the uh, opinion to change our prime minister for the next elections. If we couldn't get the vote because of the corruption case, we can change it. I think it is the power of the constitution. How do you think? Thanks. Well, when individuals that we spoke to talked about the weakness of the Constitution, they spoke um, really clearly about the aspect of rule of law, and people were very concerned about how the Prime Minister has been interfering with the prosecutors investigating corruption, um, and also the, the Constitution has been, is not been discarded. Um, that's not what we need to say at all. It's that, and there are efforts, there have been efforts that people mentioned to us to reform it, but that process have, has stopped. Um, and there, yes, there are elections, um, but that doesn't overlook the fact 
um, but there are many other concerning issues. And we do acknowledge the limits of our research um, in terms of who we talk to, which is why the conclusions we, we make come from that. But there are more people who can like fit on the side, so we can check them out. Uh, hello, my name is Mikhail. I'm from the uh, Visualization at the University of Kaifa. And my question is from Dr. Togaldi. Uh, first of all, it was very inspiring. I hope you so. Thank you for that. Uh, you have spoken about changing, changing the situation between, um, between Israel and Palestine. So the younger generation might be very interested in you elaborate about uh, so you have the same and people are you think that a dialogue between individuals around this nation is a step? Um, actually, uh, I'm opposed to um, the anti-normalization and these uh, sanctions and boycotts. I believe that uh, we should not inherit we should not copy the South African experience, but rather uh, our own experience, what worked for Gandhi in India, and what worked for uh, South Africa, and what worked for Martin Luther King in the US, that do not work for us. I believe it in the dialogue between both. I think we don't know much about each other, and building wars is resulting in uh, actually having us uh, live in a state of a lack of trust and uh, suspicion and uh, conspiracy theories and that's why I believe that we should uh, build bridges to dialogue. Unfortunately, between the period uh, 1990 to 2000, uh, 20 million to 25 million dollars were spent on people to people projects while uh, the wall actually was built with more than 3 billion dollars. So I think that we should invest more in uh, building people-to-people uh, uh, -people, uh, dialogue rather than war. talked about political Islam. I was wondering about the generation of the place where the youth. Um, where do you think they see the place of Islam in the new in the new Egypt, in the new what they wanted to create? And also I wanted to ask why do you think that the um, youth of the place well hasn't offered any political alternative to uh, more CEO now to the general? Um, very briefly, I think Cassandra probably could give you a more informed, up-to-date answer than me, but my view of, of this is, um, uh, on the second question, it's more, more clear-cut. It seems to me that this was a, essentially a protest movement against Mubarak uh, that didn't have uh, sufficient development to, uh, that hadn't uh, worked out what it wanted to happen after the fall of Mubarak, um, and uh, as a result, uh, lost the political initiative. Um, your, first, your first element of your question was um, what was Egyptian youth's attitude to Islam? Was that, was that what you said? What, what, how do they see? I, I, I can't speak for them, uh, I, but I, I'm very struck that uh, by the extent to which there was a tendency within that element that we could call the revolutionaries, of course, this is a very specific fractional segment of Egyptian. Uh, that uh, inclined to a kind of unreconstructed secularist position, that inclined to, in other words, a clash of identities. Uh, secularism being, in effect, an identity uh, in uh, identity politics in this part of the world. In other words, uh, it seems to me there was a tendency there, and also to some extent in Tunisia, even though very well moderated by other factors in Tunisia, to replicate the drama and the ideological confrontation that occurred in Algeria 20, 20 years ago where secularism functioned as an identity politics that uh, uh, was a kind of alternative brand of intolerance um, and precluded any kind of problem. That's my off-the-cuff answer for you. Thank you. <coughs> Just wanted to make sure, Cassandra, do you have, do you want to add anything to that? A uh, couple of quick points. Uh, I mean, first I would say we, we shouldn't 
we shouldn't imagine that all the youth in Tahrir were secularists just because the ones we saw on TV may have been secularists. Uh, there were a lot of Islamists who participated in that uprising. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the other thing is that the experience of Tahrir and of the 2011 uprising caused a huge shock inside uh, Islamist organizations, and particularly inside the Muslim Brotherhood. A lot of people left the Muslim Brotherhood who had been members, especially the younger members, and went on to found new movements, new parties. Precisely because, like their secondary counterparts, they rejected the, ortho the orthodoxy of the old established parties and movements. They, they felt that the Muslim Brotherhood was too autocratic, was too dominated by people over 70 year olds. In other words, too much of the Bombard regime. So, uh, uh, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that there is still an ongoing uh, rethinking, I think, among Islamists, among secularists, of these, of, uh, 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 of these questions. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. Thank you. Um, my name is Yotam. I'm also from the CDP delegation. I studied the Hebrew Union. This is a question to uh, Dr. Roberts, and a continuation of the uh, former question. Uh, my question is, what are the prospects of a uh, true secular movement, the kind that maybe uh, Professor Richard Dawkins kind of preaches for? What are the uh, prospects of that uh, same roots in the Arab world, either in short or long term? In your view. Um, not good. Uh, I, I don't pretend to know exactly what the, the Professor Hawkins has uh, said. I don't. Uh, I haven't read um, the Torah Commission. Um, but my view is that um, the the main source of the secularist position as a, an intellectual inspiration is the French model of political modernity, uh, and I'm very struck by the failure of secularist scientists, particularly the Algerian case, um, to uh, examine the logic, uh, the historical logic that produced the secular state of France. The particular circumstances uh, of the Vatican's frustration of Mirabeau's attempt at the constitutionalization of the clergy during the French Revolution, the particular circumstances that led to that uh, outcome. Uh, and the failure to uh, address at all the fact that uh, French secularism is, if you like, a prototype, is um, a um, position taken in relation to a church. Now, there isn't a church in Sunni Islam. In other words, the conditions of the existence of French secularism do not obtain in Sunni Islam. And I'm, I'm waiting for that actually to become, uh, you know, taken on board in debates about it. So I think that the answer is that if you that position is a non-starter and can function only as it has functioned, that is, as a major spoiler of other possible ways to Next question. Uh, my name is Lucio. I'm from uh, Dr. Roberts. I'm interested in um, kind of uh, trying to jumpstart that, that uh, important dialogue that you refer to uh, at the conclusion of your remarks. So, for the United States in particular, what do you think are the consequences, strategic, unfortunate, or otherwise, of failing to appropriately differentiate between the various distinct brands of Islam? Uh, you really put me on the spot. This is something I would uh, I'll just say very briefly. Um, all major powers have complicated foreign policies and complicated defense policies. But it seems to me that there's been, I think the word tension is a rather poor term. Uh, to describe the relationship between the different elements of, of uh, American foreign policy objectives in relation to the, to the, uh, the, the tension between the declared or announced objectives of promoting the rule of law, let alone democracy, and other strategic objectives as uh, I was um, And um, I think the point here I would say is that if the American government was in earnest, about promoting the rule of law uh, and promoting uh, positive democratic or change, or at least change in the direction of more representative and uh, more legitimate government. It would be very interested in taking full account of the elements of diversity within Islam. If, if it's not serious about that, uh, and if it, if it in fact tends to be influenced by those currents that are always gung ho for another war, it is actually inclined not to be. Bother about such differentiation 
and happy to bump them all together as something that can be demonized, designed fundamentalism, extremism, and so on. That is one way of at least having a first take on the tension in Russia and the debate in Russia. I welcome you. We're interested in that debate proceeding. I wish you well. So uh, by my count, we have 10 minutes left and five questions here. So if we could get all of the questions at once, and then we'll go through and have the panelists answer them uh, all at the same time. So if you could just run through the questions and alternate, please. My name is Dan, and I'm Israeli Defense Post-Delegation. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say to the Dr. Daoudi, um, I do agree with you that both sides should invest funds in uh, bringing sides together and promoting uh, media statements. Uh, the building of the wall is uh, saving lives at the present. It's very important. Investing funds in... Uh, is this a question? It's a beginning of the question. Okay, to get to the question, um, is the Wasatia movement working also um, in the Gaza Strip? And do you think that in the event of a peace treaty being signed, uh, people would accept it and uh, regard it legitimate, especially the, pe the people in the Gaza Strip. Um, and also, um, is the uh, secular population, uh, both in uh, Gaza and in uh, the West Bank, um, do you think they uh, will also uh, accept a peace treaty? Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Alex. This is the chairman of the student here at the Fletcher School. Um, my question is for anybody on the panel, I guess. I think you're all, you've all been quite right to point out the, the complexity implied in the term Islamism, but there's, there's one aspect in which I, I think it still remains pretty one-dimensional, which is in electoral politics, where it seems like most voters have a choice between the Islamist party or the party that's not Islamist. And there's not a whole lot of differentiation uh, aside from these two dimensions. I'm wondering if you would care to comment on what forces you see shaping that sort of one-dimensionality of the politics. Uh, in elections in the world. Hi, uh, I'm Gia. This question is directed to my classmates. Um, I'm wondering what, in your opinion, and in the opinions of the people that you've interviewed, uh, are the implications on a secular democracy in Turkey, given that the AKP was greatly strengthened by a so-called apolitical Islamist movement, and then subsequently has been not taken down, but has is now being threatened by the power that this Islamist movement has in the form of the tape records that they've been able to collect. Hi, my name is Joe. Um, Dr. Roberts referenced the, uh, the term political Islam is problematic as it implies the possibility of a, a, a separation of politics from Islam. Uh, but at the, at the keynote last night, we heard an interesting narrative of an, of an experiment in, in governance and politics in immediately post-World War I Syria, not so much of apolitical Islam, but as a, of a de islamization of politics. And I, was, I would like to put this question to the panelists of, well, apolitical Islam is not, may not be a term that makes logical sense. Is a de islamization of politics in the Middle East a, 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 a realistic fusion? Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Kenzie. I come from the University of China. My question is for Dr. Roberts. Um, to what extent do you agree that what of the cost is the British or European countries concerned for political Islamism is the possibility that British people or other Christian Europeans feel threatened in some way by Muslim immigrants' activities, both missionary or not? So, all right, then let's uh, last question. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Masoud Ed. I'm an activist and a blogger. Um, as the discussion went on, and this is a question to the distinguished uh, members of the panelists, um, a lot of these events uh, usually have a component of the uh, uh, passing in Israeli conflict is an issue that comes up constantly. And as we know, the, uh, the, as the Arab world is struggling to figure out its soul, um, the question in my mind is that, do you see um, any implications of this contest between seculars and non-seculars in the Arab world on the Arab-Israeli conflict? And more importantly, why even is the, uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict within, why should it be within the top ten priorities if you're interested in reforming Arab societies? 
more important than getting a lot of contacts, how uh, if this road is in the past, when it's signed a uh, peace treaty, how is that going to stabilize Iraq? Uh, or get a Saudi movement to drive, or even get to Morocco and Nazir to get his basic rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, man, I'm sorry, but I think we have a backlog of questions. It's okay. How the pen is we, you told me a very no, yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, all right, I'm sorry. my name is Sophia Ray. I'm a Palestinian from New York University, and my question is for Dr. Dozi. Um, I was just thinking that the Palestinian people are still fighting for their rights. Do you think that they're going to be able to fight for their rights? Do you think that they're going to be able to fight for their rights? Do you think that they're going to be able to fight for their rights? Do you think that they're going to be able to fight for their rights? Do you think that they're going to be able to fight for their rights? just got killed yesterday and the settlements are still going and many events are really intense, especially in the West Bank at the moment. Do you think that it's a good environment for them to accept a peace treaty where the Israelis are doing actions that are not really supporting this treaty? Do you think it's a good environment for them to accept this coexistence that we are all willing to have? That was a lot of questions. Are there any panelists who really want to get a jump on their question if they were asked? <laughs> <laughs> I can answer a question on between by default voting sort of Islamists and secularists. You know, in, in not all of these contexts is, is there just one Islamist party versus a bunch of secularist parties. In some cases there are multiple Islamist parties. In other cases there are multiple secularist parties. So what happens when one's confronted with multiple Islamist parties? Well, Presumably, one votes for platforms. Right? None of these parties have platforms uh, in Algeria. Not a single, not a single political party has an economic platform, with the exception of the Trotskyites, and that's by default, right? And so, so what these really come down to is questions of sort of people voting to distribution, right? And so, it, 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 it's a, it's more complicated than just voting secular Islamists. Um, and even within these the secularist parties, or so-called secularist parties, I mean, they're quite Islamists. Uh, and so the former head of the FLN party in, in Algeria supported a very retroactive uh, family code law in 1984. And it's frequently considered an Islamist, but he's not. He's a secularist consistent with the FLN. So what does that mean? Sort of, where does conservatism be intended into political Islam, etc., when one starts dealing with issues of family code, etc.? Anyway, that's all I need. Just to follow up the part's remark on this question of, you know, why is the choice reduced to Islamists versus secularists? It's not. In uh, Tunisia, I think, in 2011 elections, there were 56 parties at least. In some constituencies in Egypt, uh, the list of parties was so long, the voting battle was about this big, and you had over 100 parties, uh, ranging from, from communist, socialist, to, to uh, various shades of Islamism and everything. I think the question is more of why in, in the political media space so much, uh, why do usually one that, a faction that describes itself as nationalist and civil, to use the doctor uh, Mark's um, uh, words, as a, and opposes itself to Islamists, and then usually you have one or two major uh, Islamist parties. And that question is actually one that has little to do with, I mean, it has something to do with the, historical, uh, the history of these parties in these places, but it also has to do with access to resources, uh, grassroots spaces, and uh, 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 money. Money is incredibly important in elections in these countries, just like it is in America. Uh, and these, uh, these often have resources to money not only inside the country, access to, these parties have access to money not only inside the country, but also uh, support from abroad. Uh, we saw uh, it's not a privilege, it's illegal, but there are strong allegations, for instance, that presidential candidates in Egypt on both sides of the divide had access to Gulf financing. And they spent a lot of money to get uh, uh, to run their campaigns. I wanted to uh, also address the, the, uh, the, the question of the uh, implication. Uh, Nasser Badeli's question on, on the implication of uh, the Islamic secular divide on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the relevance of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to what's going on in the Arab world. Uh, the Israeli-Palestinian... My, 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 my own view is that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been this, this kind of black hole in the region, drawing amazing amounts of energy, of political and emotional energy, 
uh, for a long time for, for good reasons because there's a lot of suffering involved, but uh, often also for excess, uh, excessively because countries have continued as, and certain regimes have continued to focus on it beyond, way beyond their ability to actually influence the situation. So in a way, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict seems secondary. But the reality is, it plays that role in the Arab psyche and the Israeli psyche, uh, uh, and will continue to do so for a long time. It's perhaps unfortunate, but I think uh, 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 it is a reality. I think another reality of the region nowadays is that we have two other black holes. One is the Syrian conflict, which is incredibly destructive and so right for Syria, but is drawing increasingly its neighbors and is uh, and exaggerating the, the, the sectarian dimension together with the Persian Gulf, Iran, and Saudi conflict. Uh, and the other, I think, is, is the conflict, this conflict that is being branded as Islamist versus secular, although as I explained, I'm not convinced by, by, by that, that, that uh, has created another black hole generated from Egypt, and that has had already huge implications, certainly across the region that I cover, uh, 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 North Africa, and has influenced in the other transitions. There's a reverse effect of contagion. We had the contagion of revolution from, uh, uh, in 2011 from Tunisia to the other countries, and now we're seeing Egypt export this 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 uh, 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 this framework to uh, 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 to the West. The 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 you know my hope is is is, is that the uh, my, my conviction and my hope my, my conviction is that the, the problems in the Arab world are largely for most Arab countries, especially ones as far away as Morocco, have little to do with these really passing conflicts. And my hope will be that, because I, I'm not very optimistic about the resolution of the Palestinian-Israel Palestinian conflict, that uh, that will 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 be able to carve out enough political space to solve problems other than the Israel Palestinian conflict. The reality is that it will continue to play a big role, and it plays a big role on both sides, the secularists as well as the Zionists. Sherman, are you going to give me time to go through all of these questions? No, you're not. I'm going to give you five more minutes. It's a tremendous anxiety. Uh, I hope to see and I'll see you at 6.30 after dinner. Uh, the Deputy Secretary of State for Justice is the 7th October. That's the uh, bookends and detention period. So take five minutes if you can try to address the anxiety. All right. Um, actually, in that case, I'm going to answer the question that Gia posed. Mm-hmm. Thanks for your question, Gia. And not sure I fully understand it correctly what you're trying to say, but and we, we did study the role of Islam in Turkish government. Um, but basically since what we can say is that from two thousand two the economy has grown a lot under the Ad Party and Prime Minister Erdogan. And many people saw that as the economy grew and Turkey's now the seventeenth largest economy in the world, that they got more confident. And Rightly or not, the perception among many, especially many people at the Gezi protests, was that they were injecting um, Islamic values into a Turkish life, or tur- Turkey going back to Ataturk as a secular tradition. And the overconfidence, many people believe, has led to a series of missteps that has built up pressure in society that have kind of boiled over at, in the Gezi protests and the corruption scandal. And so the tapes that came out yesterday um, are part of that, and that they show how um, maybe an overconfidence, a willingness to engage in corrupt practices, those events are still unfolding and are unclear. But that's, if I had to uh, identify them, that's maybe what I would say. Very quickly. Uh, very quickly, um, the uh, Chinese lady, uh, Kenzie, was it? Um, the question of um, uh, um, the, uh, that's right, the concern that people are threatened by uh, Islamism, the concern about Islamism because people are threatened by Muslim um, I'd like to make an observation here that uh, there is, of course, uh, a problem in places in Britain, in France, in Germany, and so on. And, um, and this is actually uh, the other side of something bigger that unites 
this issue with the issue of Islam, Islamism in uh, Muslim countries, which is, of course, the fundamental fact of globalization. Globalization is all extremely conducive to the development of Islam. Uh, and um, one, of the, one of the numerous facts that functions of globalization or effects is to uh, diminish uh, national sovereignty and, and make it impossible in the context of uh, a world dominated by Washington's consensus and the principle that there is no alternative, makes it impossible for politics to be about economic issues. The, uh, and as a result, politics is increasingly everywhere about identity. And Islamism is simply one of the most uh, visible and prominent uh, identities because uh, it is, it's got a large uh, constituency. Uh, and as a result, we see British politics and French politics contaminated by Islamic politics in a way that is absolutely supportive of their own constitutional traditions. We shouldn't assume their constitutional traditions are eternal. They run out. And I believe that's what's happening. Uh, and the report that ICG did uh, on Islamism in France demonstrated the extent to which the problem of Islamic identity is something that is actually being constituted by the behavior of the French state. Uh, in relation to a um, uh, new, uh, new Muslim population that does not want to be involved in political life in France qua Muslims, wants to be able to be involved in political life qua individuals on the basis of social interests they share with non-Islamists. Non so that's not something that the French uh, Republic in its decline is actually allowing it to happen. It's actually reproducing colonial cliches and stereotypes and practices uh, in the metropolis. And something similar is happening in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you sure we don't have one more minute to encompass the entire uh, Israeli-Palestinian debate? Thank <laughs> you. All right. Well, uh, wait. Okay. Well, thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you very much.